We mentioned this at the, the All Spits Are Considered, the meeting, the American Astronomical Society. Um, so the meeting was held in Hawaii, hence the rainbow. And it's the big meeting that the research astronomers and others go to every year where most of the major announcements are made, hence why we called it the Super Bowl of Astronomy. But if you've been here to All Space Considered, you also know it as the time we do the Golden Griffith Awards. In fact, um, many of you have been given a ballot. We're having two rounds of voting. What happens is you're going to hear all the press conference, the press releases that were given at the meeting. You're going to hear a little summary of them tonight. And then you go vote. And round one, vote for your favorite in each category. We'll take the top two from each category. And those will move on to round two of the voting, where we'll decide which of them gets the gold in Griffith, the silver, and the bronze. Now, you come back in March, and you might get to take one of those home, actually, believe it or not. So it's an exciting time. It's award season, even here at Griffith Observatory. And it's Olympic time, too. It is. So, it's Olympic you know, time. We've so. got the right medal. We've got it all. Um, this is what your ballot looks like. If you're here tonight, feel free to fill it out. You can turn it into our ballot box, or if you like, you can go online and vote. What could possibly go wrong with voting online? Um, <clears throat> we'll do our best to keep things as fair as they possibly can be. So, on to our nominees. In the category of massive compact objects, we have these fine four topics, and we'll look at each of them individually. Molecular gas around black holes and merging galaxies. The Alma telescope saw just like it says, gas around some black holes in this messy galaxy that shows evidence that it just merged with another one. So what does it mean and how does it tie in? Nominee number two, new results from the LIGO Virgo 03 observing run. Well, that's the gravitational wave observatory, and they saw another pair of merging neutron stars. You can hear all about that if you like. Um, another step towards understanding fast radio bursts. There's these very strange bursts of radio energy that have come in a fraction of a second. Many of them don't repeat but they found a second repeating one, and you can hear all about what that means for our understanding of these weird radio phenomena in the universe. And Chandra detects proper motions in the knots of M87's jet. M87 has a supermassive black hole in the core. It's the one that was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope, actually. Well, the Chandra telescope was able to see the knots, these little clumps of gas that have been ejected from that black hole in jets, able to see them move. And it actually looks like they're moving faster than the speed of light. The key to that statement is, looks like. They're really not. So if you want to hear about that, you'd want to vote for this one. And our category number two, galaxies and cosmology. And we have these five nominees in this category. Again, the top two will move on. And the first one, a group of galaxies blowing bubbles at dawn. Well, what does that mean? It's actually the cosmic dawn. Ages ago, right after the Big Bang, there were no stars, there were no galaxies, there was gas. That gas, however, absorbed all the light. You couldn't see much. The first stars ionized it. These folks are claiming they see evidence of those first bubbles around those first stars. Wandering massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. Well, what the heck does that mean? So a survey went out looking for black holes in dwarf galaxies, just like it says. Turns out they're not always in the center. They seem to be in different areas. So what does that mean? Vote for that one to find out. The Hubble Space Telescope observed a giant spiral galaxy. It's known as Rubin's Galaxy, Vera Rubin, who took the measurements that showed the outer regions of galaxies were rotating faster than we expected based upon their, uh, the mass that we saw. So there was evidence for something going on there. Dark matter, by the way, is what, what most astronomers believe is going on. Well, this galaxy was one of the ones she observed. It turns out it's huge. It's like two and a half times bigger than the Milky Way. It's a very weird one. It's out on its own. You want to hear about that? Vote for that nominee. Um, warm dark matter chills out constraints on the nature of dark matter with quadruple image gravitational lenses. OK, that's a mouthful. <laughs> what they're showing there is these are actual like gravitationally lensed quasars. So those four little splotches you see in those images are the same object. Well, using that information and seeing how it's distorted, they were able to see some of the smallest clumps of dark matter yet. So small, maybe they haven't even made stars. So very interesting nominee there. Another nominee using gravitational lens systems. <clears throat> this time, they're able to actually measure the cosmological constants that are going on. So how much dark energy there is, how much dark matter, the expansion rate, <clears throat> simply based upon these gravitationally lensed systems. So it's an independent way to figure those out. If you want to know more about that, vote is that your favorite. 
The Milky Way is our next category. And I just love those orbiting griffies. <laughs> so these are our nominees, and let's take a closer look at them. The binary star V Sagittae will explode as a very bright nova by centuries end. Hmm. Turns out <clears throat> it's a white dwarf, has a massive companion orbiting, it's dumping material onto it. Based upon the physics we understand, a prediction has been made when this will next go nova. In fact, it will be the brightest star in the Milky Way galaxy when it does it. It'll be almost as bright as a supernova, and if you want to find out when that's going to happen, of course you could Google it, or you can come back <laughs> next month <coughs> if this is one of the winners. So at Dance with Dragons, Tess reveals Alpha Draconis is a detached eclipsing binary. This is actually a quite a bright star. Turns out it's two, and the two stars eclipse one another. It is so bright that the Kepler survey, it, it was too bright for those detectors to see it. So it didn't see this star going through these. Um, it should have been noticed earlier, but it took tests with its capabilities to be able to see this weird system where you have these two stars orbiting and eclipsing each other. A new feature of the galaxy revealed by 3D dust mapping. This is actually the Radcliffe wave, which... Um, Sounds like a dance. Yeah, well, it, it's, <laughs> as it was pointed out, it's sort of like Harry Potter waving on the train. On his way off to Hogwarts. Nobody, no Harry Potter fans. Anyway, okay, so one person gets it. If one gets the joke, it's worth it. Um, anyway, this massive structure in the galaxy looks like it's sort of a wave-like shape. Turns out if you view it from up above, it looks straight. Um, folks used to think there was a ring of star formation maybe in the Milky Way. Is that true any longer now that we have more information? Vote for this survey if you want to find out more about the structure of our own Milky Way and the star forming regions in it. The eagle-eyed view of the flying telescope reveals how the Swan Nebula hatched. Actually some Spitzer data was used in this as well, but the flying Sophia telescope made some measurements and they were able to measure star forming regions hot young stars, had to get that in there, um, in this nebula and um, learn more about it than I report. It's one of the brightest nebulas that we can see from here, at, here on Earth. Recent star formation event far in the Milky Way's halo. This is actually something I'm very interested in. I was on part of a project where we went looking for stars in this part of our halo, although we looked in the wrong spot because we didn't see any. Um, <laughs> thanks, Doug Lynn. Professor Doug Lynn told us where to go look. <laughs> Doug, call, call him out. Hey, he went observing with us. We got a theorist to go to Keck with us, so it was worth it. <laughs> um, he pointed at a dense clump of the gas. We didn't see anything. These folks looked elsewhere. Hint, it's the big blue star <laughs> in the map up there. Um, so they aren't looking at a dense clump, but it looks like the interaction of the gas from the two Magellanic clouds somehow is forming new stars very far from our galaxy. That's a weird place to be forming um, hot young stars. So, and next category, <laughs> telescopes and instrumentation. Now, even though this one only has three nominees, we are gonna take two of them. So the two of these get to go forward anyway, and only one, so maybe, anyway, don't vote for the loser, that won't work. Um, Hubble at 30, the Hubble Space Telescope is 30. It's made 30 years of discoveries. There was a whole session just about how cool Hubble is, so I, that would be a fun one to do. Astronomy confronts satellite mega constellations. Yeah, that was probably an angry session. Um, astronomers aren't so happy about the Starlink system that SpaceX has been putting up um, early in the evening when you're taking calibrations and some of your first observations. You get images like this right now. So what can be done about these constellations? If anything, how should astronomy confront it? Um, right now, there's no united front on it, so astronomers got together and talked about it to find out. Maybe we should instead of having random people angrily commenting on Twitter, maybe we need to decide what we're gonna do. Radio astronomers are similarly worried about the advent of things like 5G and um, cell phones and the cell phone technologies being put everywhere. Those interfere with the radio telescopes that we have here on Earth. And if you send satellites up into the sky, those are gonna be sending out radio signals as well. So the radio astronomers had their own session of, well, what are we gonna do with this new era of radio communication? And our final, our final group of nominees is all about exoplanets. And we have five nominees from this category. The first one is the first light for NEID, an extreme precision Doppler spectrograph for exoplanets. We, like Laura said, this is shell spectrograph. That's just Yay. a beautiful spectrum. Both of us love a shell spectrograph. So you get extremely high resolution. Yeah. My see, PhD work was with a shell data. Oh, cool. So Very cool. Fond of it. Um, these absorption lines, the little dark lines you see on the left-hand side, those are actually in 
the, um, in the stars themselves, in the atmosphere of a star, these dark lines are formed as the light is absorbed. Well, if you have enough of them, you can measure hundreds and hundreds of lines, which gives you a very precise measurement of the velocity of the star. And if there's a planet moving around it, you'll be able to see very small motions of that star as it gets tugged by that planet. So this is a new spectrograph for studying exoplanets and their atmospheres. So it's going to be a very, very cool project. Um, living with Goldilocks K-dwarfs, stellar effects of, on hosted planets. Now Goldilocks, you often hear about that with the habitable zone, the right distance to be from a star. What does it mean to have a Goldilocks star itself? Well, turns out uh, uh, the Sun is a G-type star. It's, it's fairly massive, it's hot, but it doesn't live very long. We're only going to live maybe 10 billion years. An M-dwarf can live, oh, hundreds of billions, if not a trillion years, the problem with M-dwarfs is they have a lot of X-rays to them. In between these M-dwarfs and a G-type star, there are these K-type stars. They will live a much longer time than the Sun will, 40 billion years or longer, and yet they don't have very strong X-rays. So they might be the sweet spot for finding life. Maybe planets around them will have a very long time for life to evolve, and yet they won't get fried by the X-rays. At least that's what this study is claiming. So what does it mean for the chances of life on planets? You could vote for that one. Sensitive probing of exoplanetary oxygen in the mid-infrared. What? Can we actually see oxygen around other planets with our current technology? This study is claiming that yes, in the infrared, using the Webb telescope, we might be able to see oxygen around some of these planets that are nearby, actually around these M dwarfs. Now, does that mean there's life? Maybe, maybe not. Could you make the oxygen another way? Vote for this one if you want to find out. Now, TESS found its first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. So if you want to hear all about that, vote for this one. It was actually a junior in high school that helped find this, which is just super cool. Maybe that was this one, the junior in high school. Anyway, vote for them both, and then you'll be able to figure out which one. It's, it's in my notes here, if you want to know. Let me see. I do want to get it correct. Um, yes, it's this one is the junior in high school discovered this one, and it was, appropriately enough, it's a Tatooine planet. It is a planet that is orbiting two stars. So Star Wars, Tatooine, in the sky, you see the two suns. If you were on this planet, well, you'd be squashed because it's not, it's, it's a gas giant probably, it's gassy. <laughs> but if you were on a moon going around this planet, you'd have two suns in your sunset, which would be very cool. So it's the first circumbinary planet discovered by TESS. You could hear all about it, characteristics of it, where is it is, could, is it in the habitable zone? I'm not telling you tonight. You need to vote for it if you want to find out. So voting is now open. You can go to this tiny URL. You can go to the longer web address if you like. And round one will be open for two weeks about, and then we'll open round two. We'll close round two probably Friday morning of the March All Space Considered show, so you'll be able to vote all the way up till then.